You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. Hey, if you have your Bibles, uh, meet me in James chapter 4. We're studying through the book of James, and we are in chapter 4. Pick me up in verse 13. Hear the words of the living and true God. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. I want to tag today's message, Christian Atheism. Christian Atheism. Now, when you hear that, you probably think that sounds ridiculous. Because how could you be a Christian and also an atheist? A Christian, we all know, is someone who believes in the existence of God. In fact, the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, in verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that what? He exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We know what an atheist is. An atheist is someone who denies the existence of God. So what do you mean when you say Christian atheist? This is what I mean. A Christian atheist is someone who believes in God and acts like or lives like God doesn't exist. They believe they have the right belief, but they act and live as if God doesn't exist. Now, I thought I was being clever when I came up with this title looked it up and did not know there are actually a group of people who call themselves Christian atheists. They are atheists, and what they say is, what we like is certain aspects of the Christian faith. We like the moral aspects, some of the cultural aspects. We like the community aspects of it. But the part of it that we don't believe in is the existence of a personal God. So they call themselves Christian atheist, which I thought was crazy, but that's not what I mean. I mean someone who says they are a Christian, and yet the way they live their life is unlike Christ. Now, in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, James has been continually going at us about this issue of our tongues. And so we've been talking about slander and swearing and cursing and how we deal with one another. We did a whole exercise and we've been talking about it week after week after week. It's not going to stop today. James is going to be at us again about our tongues. Look at what he says again in verse 13. He says, listen, you who say, who say with your mouth, this is going to be an issue of the things that you say. And today what he's going to be talking about, he says at the end of our text, is Arrogant boasting. You are arrogantly boasting. And what he's going to try and get us to see is that this kind of boasting is a sin. It is evil, actually. He uses the word evil. And the kind of boasting that he's talking about is the kind of speech that is arrogantly talking about that which you will do. And in this text, he gives a sort of... um, scenario that it's not necessarily a scenario that he heard actually, but he makes it up, but it's something that you hear all the time. What does he say? Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. This person is making three assumptions. Here's the first assumption, that you will go to a city. 
You just assume, I'm going to go. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to get in a plane, on a bike, and a submarine, and a train, and I'm going to get to this city. You just assume that. The second thing they assume is that they'll spend a year there. We'll go there, spend a year. So they assume that there's safety. They assume a certain amount of time. And then they assume a certain amount of success. He says that we will carry on business and make money. We'll get to this city and we will be successful. So this is a person who says, we're going to go here. We're going to stay there for this long. And then we're going to make money. And they're boasting about this. And James says that is actually arrogant boasting. You are planning to do something in the future. Now, James, he's not saying that he has an issue with planning. Because you might say, I've said this stuff too. I've talked about tomorrow. I've talked about making money. I've talked about all these kinds of things. Is James saying that it's wrong to do that? No. He's not against planning. Listen to Proverbs 21, verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. So the New Testament, the Old Testament, none of the scriptures is against planning. Things like uh, health insurance, life insurance, that is a plan. You plan to get hurt. I mean, you don't plan to get hurt, but you know it's probably going to happen that I'm going to get hurt. So you plan. Those you guys who have a business, you get insurance. There's nothing wrong with saving for retirement. He's not talking about a kind of planning that the Bible says is perfectly okay and actually is godly. He's talking about something completely different. He's talking about a kind of arrogant boasting, and the reason why it's arrogant is because of two reasons. Two reasons that he gives why talking like this is arrogant in light of these two realities. The first reality we see in verse 14, he says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You're talking about tomorrow we're going to do this, and a year we're going to do this. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. So then how could you boast about what you're going to do and where you're going to go? It's actually arrogance because you don't know. Are you going to make it safe? You don't know. Are you going to be there a year? You don't know. Are you going to make money? Is your business going to do well? You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so you're making all these plans. The book of Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 1, he says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. You don't even know what a day may bring. For Thanksgiving, I said, I'm going to go to Smart and Final and get a few things. Drove over there, parked, got out the car. And when I started walking, I could see through the glass, and I saw one of those ridiculous lines that went like it looked like it was going all the way into the produce section. And I said, I'm not staying in that. Turned around, got right back in my car, and said, I'm going to Safeway. Got my car and left. Now, did I know that the store was going to have a line like that? No idea. If I had known that, I would not have even gone to Smart and Final. I just went straight to Safeway. Because I don't know, you don't even know what's going to happen an hour from now. So then how can you make these boastful statements? We're going to go here, we're going to go there. You do not even know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's the first reason. You don't even know what's happening tomorrow. How are you going to make boast about it? Here's the second reason. Your life, look at your life. You don't, you don't, you always, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but then look at your life. What does he say about your life? He says, what is your life? You are a mist. You're a mist. Other translations say vapor, or you are a smoke. Here today, gone tomorrow. He says you're here for a little while, then it vanishes. You are a mist. This is you. Where'd you go? (laughs) This is uh, this you gone. The oldest member in our church, Deacon Allen, ninety plus years old. This is his life. My son Noah just turned nine. 
The Lord took him to days his life. Was there any difference between the life of Deacon Allen and the life of Noah? It's a mist. 90 plus, 9, 19, this is your life. Here today, gone tomorrow. He doesn't say your life is like a river. That's just going on and on and on and strong and endless. Your life, <laughs> mist. How could you be so arrogant when this is you? <laughs> Makes no sense. It's not a snake, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I saw this illustration. I want you to imagine that this extension cord goes on forever. Okay? Goes on forever. I can pull this out, and this is one of those long, ridiculous ones that you can plug up in here and use in Seattle. It's very, very long. <laughs> this is your life. Now, this little, if you're on the camera, if you can zoom in right here. This little piece of tape right here, that's your life. Imagine, this thing goes on for eternity. This is your life. You're born. You have a couple birthdays. Midlife crisis. <laughs> retirement. Living, living, living. Then eventually, we're gone. And then you got eternity. I mean, and look at this. <laughs> this is, and, and listen, and this is you? So, I'm going to go here tomorrow, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I'm gonna, and this is your life. It's a mist, and it's only here for a moment. A moment. Why, then, would you speak so arrogantly? When your life is here for a moment and then it vanishes. Your life is short. Your life is fragile. Your life is fleeting. And then you're forgotten. If you go to your high school right now, no one will know who you are. <laughs> Even if you did great things. I was at the high school the other day. Me, Josh, and Shante were all on the field. We're like... This is where we all went to school and played sports. And unless somebody off the offhand knew Josh, most of you wouldn't know any idea who we were. When we were there at school, everybody knew who we were. And within years, nobody knows who you are. You're forgotten. Just show of hands. Um, how many of you right now could name your four great-grandfathers by name? That's your blood. You don't even know their name. <laughs> you are forgot. Your family will forget who you are. <laughs> You're like, man, who is he? <laughs> we don't even know our own. We're forgotten. Last week we talked about who do you think you are? That at the center of our issue is pride. And so he says, it should not be this arrogant, boastful speech. Rather, what you should have is humble speech. Look at what he says, verse 15 again. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it's the Lord's will, maybe you've heard that little Latin phrase, Deo Valenti, if God wills, or maybe you've said it, well, we're going to go here, God willing. The idea here is, I'm not going to arrogantly boast about what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go, what I'm going to accomplish. Rather, I'm going to say, if it is God's will, then we will do this or that. What he's talking about here is one of the biggest 
themes in the scripture, and that is the sovereignty of God, the providence of God. Providence is the governing power of God that oversees his creation. And it works out his plans for it. So providence is God's looking over all of creation and making his plans for it come to fruition. Listen to Psalm 33, verse 11. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Proverbs 19.21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So God's plan, God's purpose, God's will is what prevails. And so he says, if it's the Lord's will, we will live. It is God's will that determines whether you live or you die. So you say, if I live, it's God's will. If I do not live, it's God's will. Whether we live or die, life is in the hands of God. You are not your own. You do not have power to do whatever you want to do. I don't care what you do. You can do everything you want to do to try and prevent death. But you can't do it. Thank you. There was a... Um, a guy who was talking about if you just exercise and you eat right, then you will find yourself healthy and living long. You can exercise. You can. Some of you are vegan. You don't eat no meat. All you eat is, is kale and drink cod liver oil, which is a satanic concoction if you've never had that. It doesn't matter. There was a magazine publisher. His name was J.I. Rodale. And he was very famous for coming up with this idea of um, organic, which is, you know, foods that don't have pesticides on it. 72 years old, he's um, saying to this company or this uh, newspaper, he says, you know, I'm, I'm going to live till I'm 100 because I don't eat anything bad. I exercise. And he said, my bones, he's in this interview and he says, my bones are stronger than they've ever been before. While he's giving that interview on television, dies. Of a heart attack. In 1999, a woman in the United Kingdom died after her underwire bra punctured her heart. In 1919, a large tank of molasses burst in Boston, Massachusetts causing a massive wave of molasses to flood the streets. Several people were killed and many were injured in what became known as the Great Molasses Flood. You, now, you do not know when you will die. And it is the Lord's will whether you live or die. You think, I'm going to live to this age, I'm going to do this. I mean, if, if it's not the Lord's will, you will not do it. And you think, if I just do all the right things, I eat right, and I go to the doctor, listen, you should do that. Please do that. But what is 10 years added to this? I'm not saying it's not good to take care of yourself. Please do that. But I'm just saying, in the grand scheme of things, adding a few inches to this is not going to mean much of anything. It is the Lord's will whether you live. And he says, it is the Lord's will. Watch it. He says, if you do, if we're going to do this or that. So what is the this and what is the that? Whatever it is. Got a business? Listen, the success of your business, the success of your ministry the success of your life is determined by the will of God. Not your ingenuity, not your wisdom, not your gifts. Listen, you should study. You should use wisdom. You should save. You should get advice from people. All that is good to being successful. I'm not saying that. But if God doesn't want you to be successful, you won't be. Your ministry, this was so freeing to me this week. Your ministry, who comes, is all the Lord's. Be faithful where I have you and just do what I ask you to do and I'll take care of all the other things. 
because it is God's will. If we do this or that, don't think that it's your abilities, it's your gifts. Leave the results to the Lord. Examples, Paul speaks like this in Acts chapter 18, verse 21. Look at it, he says, but as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. 1 Corinthians 4, 19, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only those, these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 7, for I do want, I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. So Paul, he shows us this is the way that you're supposed to speak. Now here's the question. Does this mean that every time you talk about something that you need to say, if the Lord wills or if the Lord permits, if that's the way you should always be talking? Um, let me give you two answers. First one, yes. Why? Because James says, you should say. So you should use your mouth to say. Your children should hear you saying, if the Lord wills. Your co-workers should hear you saying, if the Lord wills. Your family, the people who are around you, should be able to tell that you put your trust in the sovereignty and providence of God, and not in yourself. So you should be saying, if the Lord wills, but also no. You should not have to say that all the time. One is because Paul doesn't even talk like this all the time. This is Romans 15, verse 28. So after I have completed this task, and I have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Now, the rest of the chapter, he doesn't say, God willing, God permit. He doesn't say it. So he's not saying that every time you speak, you need to say it. But what he is saying is this idea of God willing, the Lord permits, needs to be something that is sort of the umbrella. It's always over your life. It's the lens through which you do everything. So you wake up in the morning and you say, Lord, everything that happens today, whether I live or I die, it's your will. Whether I'm successful or I fail today, it's up to your will. And it needs to be something that you don't have to say it. People just know that's what he believes. That's what she believes based on the way they carry themselves. So you don't have to always say it. Sometimes people are weird. I'm be going to the bathroom, Lord willing. <laughs> Go to get some McDonald's, Lord willing. Like, don't be weird. Don't be strange. But be the kind of person who speaks like... My life is not in my hands. The success is not in my hands. It's in the Lord's hands. So what should we do? James wants us to do something very, very simple. Invite the Lord into your plans. The idea here is you are arrogantly boasting. You are forgetting about God. To forget about God is evil, is sin, to be a Christian and forget God is evil. What does God want you to do? He wants you to invite him into his plan. Not ignore him, but invite him. Nobody likes to be forgotten. You ever been forgotten? Have you ever been ignored? We used to have Bible study in Marin, and my parents, they would drive separately. And me, my brother, and my sister would either ride with my mom or my dad. So after Bible study... We would hop in one of their cars and, and leave. So my brother Josh, this one uh, Bible study, he decides to go up to my grandfather's house. And my parents leave from Marin City, assuming that he's with one or the other. My mom thought he's with my dad, my dad thought he's with my mom. So they get home, and they're like, where's Josh? What do you mean, where's Josh? And then my grandfather calls on the phone. And he said, look what I have. <laughs> what? So my dad took a drive down to Marin. And let me tell you, it was not a pleasant ride for Josh on the way back home. They didn't forget him on purpose. They didn't forget him because they didn't love him. But just to be forgotten and ignored is, is tragic. Nobody likes for you to bring some food for everybody but you. 
And in the same way, God doesn't like to be forgotten, ignored, left to the side. God wants you to make plans and to bring him into everything. And what people often do is they want to bring God in after they've done everything. You already did all your plans. It's like an officer who takes his gun, bang, 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 freeze. <laughs> you have the order reversed. <laughs> you say freeze. And then if you don't comply, then you shoot. We do it the opposite way. We want God to just bless the plans that we've already made. It shouldn't be that way. Now, as a church, you know, we're reading 2 Samuel as a, as a body, and we're, this Wednesday we'll be going over it. And just to say this, that we read a book as a church every month because we want to grow in our love for God and in our knowledge of God's Word. And if you're not coming to Sunday or to Wednesday for Bible study, you are missing out on something that is so important. And let me just say this, because some may say, well, I'm not going to go because I don't know a lot, or I don't understand, I'm not as smart, I'm not as knowledgeable. Listen, nobody who knows anything has always known everything. And so don't not come because you think you won't know. Will you have questions you don't know? Yes, because you're not all-knowing. Some people, they want, it's actually a prideful thing to want everybody to think that you know everything. You should, act, you should actually be the kind of person, I want people to know, I, I don't know everything about this book. I don't understand everything about this book. So don't let that keep you from coming. We have a good time. We have fun. Yes, at times you will feel stupid. Because <laughs> you don't know everything. But you leave. Every time we leave, you leave knowing more than you knew when you came. So I'm inviting you to come. Now, commercial's over. Now. 2 Samuel chapter 1, I was reading, and maybe David had been being chased by Saul all over Jerusalem, trying to kill him. And so finally Saul has died. And so in chapter 2, he's, he's wondering what to do now. And this is what he says. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord. He asked the Lord. He consulted the Lord, prayed to the Lord. And he said, shall I go up to one of the towns in Judah? He asked. The Lord said, go up. David asked, where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David, in this very moment, is saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? He doesn't say, well, I know what to do. He asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? He invited God into his plans. And this actually happens three more times in 1 Samuel, where he asks God for his help, his advice, or his direction. God wants us to invite him into our plans. One of my favorite movies growing up was a movie called Sandlot. It was about these kids who would play baseball in a sandlot, and uh, they would bring a baseball every day, and if they hit the baseball over the fence into Mr. Myrtle's yard, who had a dog named the Beast, and if you hit a baseball into that yard, he would take the ball, you couldn't do anything with it. And so all these stories about Mr. Myrtle being an evil man, a, a mean man, and the dog being able to eat children, he was terrible. So when the baseball went over there, they just let the baseball go, and they just went and bought another ball. Well, one day, one of the new kids, he brings a ball, but it's signed by Babe Ruth. So when they hit it over into the, uh, the house, they go, oh, just forget it. But he says, no, 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 we can't do that. It's signed by Babe Ruth. And they go, Babe Ruth, and they run, and they look in there, and they have to figure out how we're going to get this ball because it's valuable. And so a lot of the movies about how they tried to get this baseball out. And so the only way they were able to finally get it out is Benny the Jet Rodriguez. He had to jump over the fence, get the ball, and run out before the dog could get him. So he does it. He succeeds. But then the dog jumps the fence and starts to chase him all around town. All around town, back to the sandlot where he runs and a fence falls on him. And you would think, the beast is gone. The beast is dead. Let him die. But they have compassion. No, let's, let's save him. So they lift the, the fence off of him. He comes out and then starts to lick them. He befriends them. Thank you for saving my life. So they take the dog, the beast, to talk to Mr. Myrtle to say, hey, we, we uh, have your dog. Mr. Myrtle's blind. And they said, yeah, um, we jumped over your fence. We got this, and here's your dog. And he takes the baseball. I said, ooh, I never, nobody's ever got the best of, I forgot his name, the dog, actual name. Never ever got the, beast, the, the best of him. And he said, why didn't you just knock on the door? I would have gotten it for you. 
And they started to beat up one of the kids who had said, Mr. Martyr will kill you. Don't, don't knock on the door. All you had to do was knock on the door and he would have got, you wouldn't have to do all the things that you did. Almost lose your life. If you had just knocked on the door, I would have gotten it for you. What a line. That God would say to us, if you had just knocked on the door, I would have gotten it for you. You went through all this to get something I could have just given to you had you asked. When my dad was in Africa, we had this issue with the bank. We were trying to figure out how to get into an account with the um, housing complex that we uh, manage. And so we, were try- we, we had all the information. We, we did everything we could do. We FaceTimed my dad. We talked about this and that. We went into the bank. The guy told us, no, you can't do this. You got to do the, the person has to be here. Your father has to be here. He was like, well, he's not here. He's in Africa. What are we going to do? We need to get this uh, stuff into these people. Otherwise, we're going to get in trouble. So we're going through this, and this is days of this. I'm stressed out. I don't know what to do. We're talking to our people. We're trying to f- figure this out. We're doing everything we can. We're online. We're talking to their, their people there who say, oh, no, just do this, do this, do this. We do it. Do this, do this, do this. It doesn't work. So it's coming down to the wire. A couple uh, a day late, and we're going to be in trouble. So I'm sitting in front of the bank. I'm just like, okay, Lord, what, what, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? I'm not even praying. I'm just saying, what am I supposed to do? This thought comes, did you even ask God for help? Did you even ask God for help? So I said, Lord, would you just you give me wisdom? What to do? I don't know what to do. We've been in the bank. So right after I said this, and let me go in there, and as I'm walking in there, this question comes to my mind to ask, or this statement to ask, so to say. I get in there, I say the statement, and she goes, oh, what's this? Okay, take this paper and put it in. Within 30 minutes, had access to everything. Now listen, what I'm not telling you is that all you got to do is pray and then God will give you every answer you want. God will always give you what you're asking for. But I am saying, at a minimum, all God wants, he's saying, is I just like to be involved. Invite me in. And sometimes God will give you what you're asking him for. And God, he doesn't care. He just wants to be involved. He, he doesn't have a preference. You can live on that street, go to that school, marry this person. Just involve me. The posture of your heart is that I always want to run it by the Lord. So it's arrogant to believe I don't need the Lord. I don't want to invite him into what I'm doing. And he ends by, he ends weirdly. Look at it again, verse 17. After he said all this, verse 17 says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Like, what? This is a weird way to end. What are you even talking about? And I stared at this verse like, okay, I don't get, how does that connect to what you just said? And writers, scholars, and commentators, they have different ideas about why exactly he ends that way. But the more I looked at it, I said, oh, I know exactly why he said that. This word, anyone then, You can look at it, you could translate, therefore. So James actually meant to say what he said right after he said all of that. Is James here, he's talking about a certain kind of sin. And it's a sin of omission. We know that there are sins of commission, right? Sins of commission are sins that you do, actively do, that God says not to do. Murder, steal, those are sins of commission. But the sins of omission are the sins that you do, or, or sins that you, sins of omission are things that you fail to do that God wants you to actually do. So these are sins of omission, and look at what he says. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. So take, for example, the parable of the Good Samaritan. We talked about that a little bit last week. This Samaritan and this man is going down from Jericho on this dangerous road. He gets beat up by robbers. And as he's been beat up by robbers and they leave him, a, a Levite and a priest, they, they pass him. Two kinds of sin in this parable. The first is the robbers who beat him up. You shouldn't murder, shouldn't kill, shouldn't hurt, so try and destroy people's lives. But then there's another sin in there. These religious people, they do not stop and help. They should help him, but they don't. A sin of omission. There are things that God asks you to do, and if you don't do them, they're actually sin. 
It is a sin for you to not be involved in ministry in your church. You know why? Because God is giving you a gift. God has not called you to be a consumer, but to serve. Church isn't Costco or Starbucks, a place to get what you need and then move on. Can you imagine volunteering to go to a soup kitchen kitchen, and when you get there, expecting the people who are there who are homeless to serve you? Or sitting in the corner and just clapping and saying, ooh, good job, guys. God has not called you to just come and sit. He has called you to be involved. It's a sin of omission. Jesus, on the last day, when he condemns the goats, why does he condemn the goats? He condemns them because not of what they've actively done, but what they failed to do. He said, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me something to drink. I was in prison, you didn't come and visit me. Those are sins of omission. So you might say, well, I didn't kill the man who was hungry. Yeah, but you didn't feed him either. So if you forget and ignore God in your planning, it is a sin. And now what he's saying is the one who knows the good he ought to do. What is the good? The good is to remember God and not to forget him, to invite him and to involve him in your plans. That is the good. If you do not do the good, you sin. Because he says, now you know, I've told you. I have, I have preached, I have taught this message. So now you have no excuse to not invite God into your plans. So let me ask you a question. Are you planning vacations? We're going to go here. We're going to go there. Spend a little time here. Just a question. Have you invited the Lord into your planning? Do you have business ideas and ways to make money? Ooh, I got this great idea. It's going to work. I'll just get it. Question. Have you even asked the Lord for his input? I got some good ministry ideas. This is going to bring so many people to the Lord. Question. Have you asked God about it? Are you living like a Christian atheist or like a Christian? He says those who are saying, we will do this or that. And we will go here and there. And I will do That's what a Christian atheist says. The Christian says, not what I will, but what he wills. So my question to you, are you praying the way like Jesus taught us to pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Humble speech, not arrogant speech, trusting and inviting God into every plan that you make. Let's pray. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.